So glad you are here. Mormonism is, a, is it's an interesting topic, uh, and, and as evidence, everybody showed up today. So um, for me, it kind of comes a little bit, it's a little bit of a personal subject for me, not because I come from a Mormon background or because I have Mormon family or anything like that, but uh, my family and I about seven years ago, maybe eight years ago, we moved to Gilbert, Arizona, uh, which is kind of the... Kind of, I didn't realize it at the time, but it's kind of the heart of Mormonism in the East Valley. I mean, Mesa area, Gilbert, all that whole area, is, it's very, very uh, Mormon heavy. Uh, and so we went there and we put our kids in a, in a charter school that we, we found out that most of the kids there, probably, I would say probably 70% would probably be a, on, maybe on the underside conservative percent of the students who go there are, go to the Mormon church. Uh, a lot of our neighbors are Mormon. There, there's, and and uh, not too long ago, they were building one of the new temples out there, the Gilbert Temple. I don't know if anybody's ever seen that one pop up right off the 202 there. And my wife works with a bunch of guys who are also Mormon because she works out that way. And, and they invited us to go to the temple and to tour it. I, I guess they had one at the Mesa Temple here not long ago because they were doing some renovations. Has anybody ever done one of these temple tours? Yeah. Um, so we got to go. This is, I got some slides, but this is, the, uh, this is just a picture of what the Gilbert ones looks like if you've never seen it. You can't miss it. It's huge. And at night, they light the thing up. And on the very top, there's a golden angel with a trumpet on top. And it is, it is beautiful architecturally. It, it really is. Yeah, it is paid for. Yeah, that's true. Uh, and and it, it was an interesting experience to go do it if you've ever had a chance. They only let people who are not part of the LDS Latter-day Saints, you know, Jesus Christ Latter-day Saints Church. Um, they don't like to be called Mormon. They, they've kind of uh, pushed that to the side. They like to be called LDS now. Um, but people who are part of the LDS Church, they're allowed to go to the temple if they're in good, uh, in good standings with the church. But if you are not part of the LDS Church, the only time you can actually go in, inside of a temple is when it's being built, because it hasn't been like, consecrated yet, uh, or when it's under reno renovations. And so uh, we got to go inside and kind of see it. And, I, and I, even afterwards, uh, because some of the guys that my wife worked with um, were so, so gracious to us, and, and I was asking a whole bunch of questions because I'm a pastor, <laughs> And they knew that. And I was asking a whole bunch of questions about their faith and what they believed and why there were so many different rooms for, for changing and what, what this is all about and what that's all about. Because there's just a lot of different things that are just very different from Christianity, from what we're used to here at our church. And, and so I was talking to them a lot about it. And I even ended up taking the guy out for, for uh, lunch later on, asking if I could ask him more about his faith and really got to sit down with him and talk to him more about it. And the more that I've unpacked and the more that I've kind of learned and studied Mormonism, it's kind of set like a bit of a personal thing for me where I want to study it more and learn more because like my kids are growing up with these kids my, my family's all around these these people uh, it's very uh, Arizona is very heavy with with just uh, influence from the LDS church and a lot of you are here today probably because you have family members maybe you have a background in this maybe you have friends or co-workers people you know maybe you just have one a, a LDS church in your neighborhood and you're wondering what that's all about. Uh, and so um, how many of you are here just because you have a personal so a relationship with somebody who is LDS and you just want to know more about what they, what they believe? Okay, right on. How many of you like actually have personal experience? Anybody coming, uh, maybe you're part of the church or you've been out of the, coming out of the church, anybody? I talked to some people actually in, my, in one of my classes this morning that uh, they're like, oh yeah, we grew up in it and we came out of it. It was pretty fascinating to hear their story. Um, but today I just want to, I really just want to ask this question, okay? What's the difference? Uh, when you talk about Christianity and Mormonism, what is the difference? And that's what we're going to be covering in this kind of series that we're going to be teaching over the next few weeks, just hitting different religions. Uh, but what's the difference between Mormonism and Christianity? Because here's the thing. With Mormons, uh, and, and excuse me if I say Mormons a lot, because I know they like to be called LDS, but it's going to be hard to, to flip-flop. But with them, a lot of times as Christians, we see eye-to-eye -eye on a lot of things, actually. They, they make good neighbors. They're very, they're very, mor they're very moral. Moral? <laughs> moral. <laughs> Very moral people. They, 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 they're, very, they're very moral. They're very righteous people. They, they really believe in service. They believe in missions work. They believe in helping other people. Uh, they make great neighbors. They believe in uh, being righteous. They, they don't drink. They don't smoke. They don't, they don't do all these other bad things that other people are doing. And so uh, a lot of times as Christians, we see eye to eye with them on a lot of ethical issues. We see eye to eye with them on a lot of political issues. We find often that, that Christians and Mormons tend to be on the same side of the aisle politically because we tend to side in, in see things very similar. Um, and so when we look at the world, and you, even just this week I was uh, reading an article that came up. There was a controversy about, uh, have you ever seen the movie Ch or the show Ch The Chosen? Um, uh, just recently, I guess, it, it, got, it got all controversial because one of the people who was funding that uh, project was, was somebody who's from an LDS church. And so they're like, oh my goodness, is this a Mormon thing? So this is all thing. And, and a lot of people were coming out of the woodwork going, well, it doesn't matter. We're all Christians. 
we all follow Jesus, right? And that's, and here's the thing is, if you ask anybody who's part of the LDS church, are you a Christian? What are they going to tell you? They're going to say yes, because their name, the Church of Jesus Christ, the Latter-day Saints, right? They believe in Jesus. They follow Jesus. So obviously, in their minds, they're Christians. Um, but here's the problem is that when you get into the definitions of what it means when they say that they follow Jesus, who they say Jesus is is very different than who we say Jesus is. Who they say God is is very different than who we say God is. The, the, when you start defining the terminology, uh, it's, it's very different. But here's something interesting. Uh, if you look, here's just from uh, their website. From uh, It's actually uh, one of their, their scriptures at the very end of, I believe it's the Pearl of Great Price. They have a section called the Articles of Faith. And this is Joseph Smith wrote this. And these are just like their statement of faith of what they believe. And here's like just the first four. And if you look at this, a lot of times you can compare it with almost any statement of faith to most churches out there. And, and many churches would be in agreement. Like, look at this. It says, number one, it says, we believe in God, the eternal Father, and in his Son, Jesus Christ, and in the Holy Ghost. Well, most of us would say, okay, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, we agree with that. We believe that men will be punished for their own sins and not Adam's transgressions. Okay, we can kind of get on board with that, although that, the wording there gets a little interesting. Number three, we believe that through the atonement of Christ, all mankind may be saved by obedience to the laws and ordinances of the gospel. Okay, we might say, okay, we, we can kind of get on board with that. Uh, number four, we believe that the first principles and ordinances of the gospel are first, faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Second, repentance. Third, baptism by immersion for the remission of sins. Fourth, laying on of hands and the gifts of the Holy Ghost. There's a lot of churches that, that would align with uh, similarly to their statements of faith. So you start looking at some of the things they say they believe, and for most people, unless you really get into the nitty-gritty of the language, for most people, you kind of read over that and you go, wow, that sounds like most churches. Maybe a little more charismatic there with the gift of the Holy Ghost thing in the bottom, but you're like, that sounds like most churches out there. Like, what is the difference? And they say, well, we're very similar. Um, but the question is, what is the big difference? And it really gets into when do you, where, how do you define the terms? Uh, so here's something that the Mormon... Uh, one, of the, one of the apostles of the Mormon church, Bruce R. McConkie, he, wrote, he said this. I found this quote. Mormonism is Christianity. Christianity is Mormonism. Mormons are true Christians. And this gets into what the Mormon church believes. They believe that they are Christians. In fact, they are not just Christians. They are the real Christians. They are the true Christians who have restored the church to what it originally was supposed to be. And since Christianity became so corrupt over the years. And so they believe that they are the one true church. And they would say, we are Christians. Yes, we are Christians. And they would look at us and say, you're Christians, but you're those Christians. We're the true Christians, right? And, we, and, and to be fair, similarly, we might look at them and say, okay, we're the true Christians and you all are something different. And, and it kind of goes back and forth that way a little bit, right? And so here's the thing. As we get into this, uh, I want to get into the history of the church a little bit really quick. Um, and then we're going to compare a little bit to just some of their beliefs versus Christian beliefs and, and, and where the differences kind of lie. Um, but I really do want to be fair to, to as, as I get into this, it's really easy for me to start mocking or to start laughing. And, and there may be some, some points where I do that. And so forgive me if I do. That's my sinful nature coming out. But <laughs> I really do. I hope that as we study this in other, in other religions as well, that it's not just, oh, my gosh, look at them. They're bad. Oh, they're so different from us those horrible people. Instead, I'm hoping that our heart kind of opens up to what they believe and how these people are different than us. And, and instead, we have a bit more compassion and say, oh my goodness, they're, they're so close, but they're not quite where as Christians we think they should be, right? They're missing the mark. And, and our heart should break for them and want to help them see the truth rather than just bash them because they're evil or they're different or they're, they're preaching something different than we are, okay? So, here we go. Um, let me just get a little bit of the history of the church. So, Joseph Smith Jr. is the founder of the Mormon Church. Here's a, a, a picture of him that somebody painted. I found this on their website, the Mormon Church website. Um, and he was born in Vermont in 1805, I think it's 05, actually. I think that might be a typo. But 1804, 1805 in Vermont. So think about this. Christianity is how many, you know, if, if you say, okay, it started at Jesus, then it's a couple thousand years old at least. Uh, if you say before him, which, you know, all the way back to Adam and Eve is way older than that. Mormonism compared to Christianity already is, is almost an infant religion. Uh, it's only been around for a couple hundred years. Uh, not, even, not even a full couple hundred years. Uh, their founder was born in the 1800s, right, in America. Uh, it's an American, American religion. And, and something uh, that the LDS church has kind of distanced itself from for many, many years, it was kind of a, a, a closet secret of theirs that they didn't really 
talk about, but it's become more public recently, and actually recently the church has finally embraced it and just and, and come public and talked about it, is that Joseph Smith's uh, history as a kid and younger years are, are a little bit um, different. So he grew up in, in uh, Vermont back in the day, and, and then in, in his family, he was born into a very poor farmer family. Uh, and they, were, they failed as farmers over and over again. They had bad years, bad crops, and they were really, they were really struggling really hard. Uh, and so Joseph Smith, one of the things that he actually started doing with his father as a child is he would do something, practice something called uh, using seer stones. I don't know if you know what that is, but it was basically he would take these stones and he would go to people and say, look, I have this ability where if I look into this stone, he'd put it in a hat, he'd look into the stone in the hat, and he'd say, I have this ability where I can find treasure that is buried in the earth. And if you pay me a certain amount of money, I will look into my hat, and I will be able to lead you to where these spirits or angels have hidden this treasure deep below the earth. They'll show it to me, they'll reveal it to me, and I can bring you to it so you can dig up this buried treasure. Okay? And, and him and his dad, they did this many, many times. They did this all over the place, and they would go, and they'd take people out to look for, for buried treasure. He'd, put his, you know, he'd look in his hat. And Joseph became known as this guy who, this young boy who had this ability, this unique gift to use seer stones. Now, amazingly, they never found any of the treasure. Um, and people still continue to pay him. And what would happen, I guess, is he would go and he would, he would tell them that it was at this spot. Absolutely. They'd start digging. After a while, they wouldn't find anything. He'd look in and he'd go, oh, you know, the spirits have moved it. Um, the angels moved it. Maybe because you guys weren't righteous enough. Maybe you weren't good enough. Something like that. And, and so they would, they would constantly, it would be like this constant moving mark. They never actually found any treasure. But they would actually go and they'd be looking for treasure for a long time, digging up holes, looking for treasure. And, and the reason this is relevant uh, is because it, it, it plays into how he actually ends up translating the Book of Mormon later on. So uh, quite, quite interesting. Uh, so here, here's the thing. When Joseph Smith was uh, 14 years old, oh, there's a picture. I found it. Um, this is actually from their, their uh, museum. They actually, this is one of the seer sons that Joseph Smith actually had. Um, uh, so it, this may not have been the exact one he used during this time, but it, was, it is one of his that was in his possession. So that's kind of what it looked like right there. Uh, and one of the things that's interesting is when Joseph Smith was about 14 years old, he claims, and he didn't tell anybody this until much, much later, but he, he claims that when he was 14 years old, he had a vision that they call the first vision. This was in 1820. So in 1820, Joseph Smith has this vision. He's praying, he says, in this grove in a forest near his family farm that was in New York now, in Palmyra. Palmyra. I'm not sure if that's how you say it, but he's in New York. He's praying in this, in this forested area, and he says he was going to the Bible for guidance on what Christian denomination he should join. Which one is the true church? What, what should I join? Now, if you know anything about American history around this time, 1820s to 18, I think it's like 1810s, even to 18. 30s and 40s, was the second great awakening in America. And so a lot of church revival, a lot of camp meetings, a lot of different denominations sprung out of this. More uh, Methodists and Baptists and all sorts of different denominations were coming out of the woodwork. And there's all these different groups and branches of Christianity saying, we're the, we're the best church. And, we're, you know, and there's a little bit of uh, fighting over that. And so Joseph, as a, as a young boy, saying, well, I was praying, which one's the right one? Which one do I join? Is it, is it Methodist? Is it Baptist? Presbyterian? Catholic? What, what should I do? And so he said he read in James 1, 5 that you should pray for wisdom. So he prayed for wisdom, and then he had this vision. He says he saw God and Jesus appear to him. And here's, you can't really see it. This is a painting that they have on their uh, the LBS website. Um, God and Jesus appeared to him together as two separate persons, and they told him that he shouldn't join any of the churches. They're all wrong. In fact, they were going to use him to restore the true church. And, and so this is how... According to Joseph Smith, how Mormonism began when he was 14 years old. Now, again, he didn't tell anybody about this until he was much, much older. Uh, but this is what he says and he claims happened. Oddly enough, though, his life didn't change. So he, is, he has his vision from God, but he still goes and he still treasure hunts uh, to go help his father and to help out on the farm. Well, then three years later, in September of 1823... <laughs> Joseph Smith has another visitor, and this is an angel comes to him in the middle of the night, and his, the angel's name is Moroni. And Moroni comes to him and tells him about this ancient spiritual book that has been lost. It's written on golden tablets, and it's been buried in a hill site just three miles away from his farm. And so he tells him, this is where it is. This is what you're going to do. You need to go f find it. And so he does. He goes and he looks for it, and he finds it, he says. Uh, but the angel says, you can't open it yet. 
you got to re kind of you got to rehide it, and I'll tell you when it's time that you can actually look at it. So he's in the, under punishment of if you do this, you're going to be killed. Okay. Well, he says, okay, I'm, I'm not going to look at it yet, but I know where it is. I found it, and I hid it again, and it's still there. Uh, and so. Supposedly he, find, he found him, and then in 1825, so this is a couple years later still, Smith then meets his wife, his first wife, Emma Hale, who was 21 years old at the time when he met her, while he was out treasure hunting on an expedition with her father in Harmony, Pennsylvania. So he's still, this is years later, he'd already supposedly found these gold tablets, and now he's out treasure hunting again, and that's when he meets uh, the woman who had become his wife. Well, then a year later in 1826, Interesting fact about him that, again, the, the LDS Church doesn't talk about, but this is a historical record. You can see the documents today. Uh, Joseph Smith uh, was arrested under criminal complaints that are filed against him for fraudulently using seer stones, which was actually a crime back in the day. He was, he was, he was, uh, he was using divination. They didn't like that. Uh, very Christian uh, society right back in the 1800s, uh, using these supposed seer stones to, to get, take people's money from them. So he actually gets put on trial uh, for criminal charges. Um, and on public record, he admitted that he was doing this. And so this is why eventually the, the LDS Church had to admit, yeah, this is something that, that was part of Joseph Smith's past. <laughs> well, uh, those tr after he kind of admits to it, the, the, the charges are kind of dropped, and, and he moves on with his life. Four years later, uh, from the time that he had his vision, in, uh, so it's 1827 now, if you're tracking with me, Joseph Smith then married Emma Hale, and he's finally then finally able to retrieve the tablets for the first time. So he goes and he gets the, tra the tablets from this hill. He digs them up. But, of course, the angel tells him what? You cannot let anyone see them. Because if anybody sees them, you're going to be killed. God's going to smite you, right? And so, you don't want to be smitten by God. Smitten? Smoten? You don't want God to smite you, right? So he did, he's like, I can't show anyone the tablets. So he brings them back. Uh, and what he ends up doing is he ends up finding with these tablets, he says he finds these uh, these two seer stones that were with the tablets buried so that he could see them, they're called the Urim and the Thummim, if I'm saying that right. Uh, and he actually, they were in these like, interesting spectacle things, and he would actually then go uh, use these seer stones. And the it, interesting way that he would translate them now, if you, and if you understand his past, it makes sense, but the way that he would actually translate the book of these golden plates into what is today the Book of Mormon is he would actually place the stone in a hat, and here's just kind of a drawing <laughs> written of it. He may have actually been behind a curtain, too. But he placed these stones in a hat, stuck his face into the hat, or used the hat at least to block the sunlight so he could see the stone better. And by staring at the stone, he could then, God gave him the ability to translate these supposed golden tablets that no one had seen that were supposedly written in this language that he called Reformed Egyptian, which is uh, a language that no one has ever uh, discovered any evidence of ever. Um, and, but he claims it's kind of like hieroglyphics or something of that nature. And supposedly he could then, by looking at these seer stones, he then dictated what God allowed him to translate the tablets into to, to somebody else who would then write it down. At first it was his wife, Emma. So he sat down and he started writing with Emma. Uh, and then, uh, let's see, in, he, he needed some financial assistance. So he, he recruited this guy named Martin Harris, who was also in Pennsylvania. And uh, this guy who was a farmer, Martin Harris, ended up helping fund him a little bit. And then through his looking at the stones, he ended up dictating the Book of Mormon to Martin Harris. Now, here's an interesting fact about Martin Harris that not a lot of people will talk about in the, in the LDS Church, maybe not a lot of them even know about, is after they finished up the translation for the first time, he took the translation that he had written down to his wife to show her, and somehow, I don't know how it all went down, somehow along the way, he lost it. There goes the translation. It's gone. So, so he goes back to Joseph Smith, who was furious with him, right? I just spent all this time telling you, looking in this hat, of what the Book of Mormon was. And so now he's got to do it again. Well, circumstances happen. Apparently, Joseph Smith said that, that God was mad at him for this. And so it's going to be a while before he's going to be able to do it again. And it wasn't until another year later that Joseph Smith recruited somebody else um, whose name was, I wrote it down here so I don't forget, um, Oliver Crowd Cowdery. He recruited him as a scribe, and, and Oliver Cowdery helped him finish translating the Book of Mormon again for the second time. And then eventually, through uh, Martin Harris actually taking up a $3,000 dollar mortgage on his farm, they were able to fund publishing the Book of Mormon for the first time in 1830. In 1830. And so that translation became what is known as the Book of Mormon today. Um, and 
And that's the original 1830 edition picture right there, just from the LDS Museum. Uh, that's what it looked like when it was first published. And so they would go around, they sold this for about $1.25 per book, which I think back then was probably a good amount of money, I don't know. Um, a lot more than it is worth today than $1.25, right? You can't even get a gallon of gas for that. Uh, <laughs> so, so here's what happens. They, trend, they write this Book of Mormon. In the Book of Mormon, what it is, supposedly, is it's the account uh, of these people who came to the American civilization long, long ago. The, the Book of Mormon covers a span of somewhere between 22,000 uh, BC and 400 AD. So way, way, way back, way back in the day, supposedly it came back. Uh, and there's people who came to the Americas. Now, it, supposedly there was this group of Jewish people um, and they came to America via a boat that God told them to build, and they sailed across and, and got to America, and they came and they became these two tribes. And the Book of Mormon is the, kind of the account of these two tribes that became the Nephites and the Lamanites. Okay, the Nephites and the Lamanites, supposedly this ancient civilization that, that settled in America. And after a while, um, this civilization uh, built up, and then. Supposedly, amazingly, after Jesus was crucified and, and resurrected in Jerusalem, he uh, went and he visited America after that. And he went to America, and that's when he saw the Nephites, and he presented the gospel to them and told them about the true church and all that stuff. And so this Book of Mormon is supposedly the account of how Jesus visited America to these Jewish people who had moved there a long time ago instead of these different tribes. Everybody tracking with me? <laughs> And, and then that's how they heard about it. And now this was incredible to them. They heard about Jesus. They believed in him. But unfortunately, the Nephites, who were the, the good Jewish tribe, and the Lamanites, who were the bad Jewish tribe, the Lamanites attacked and, and had this huge war and battle and defeated the Nephites. The Nephites were wiped off the face of the earth pretty much. And so that's how kind of their civilization kind of ceased to exist, and they buried their gold tablets so that they can one day be retrieved by Joseph Smith when he was chosen by God. Um, now, that's kind of the story. And, and interesting enough, um, part of their story, and we'll cover this a little bit later, is that because the Lamanites killed the Nephites, God cursed them with darker skin, and therefore they became the current uh, Native Americans today. Uh, that's part of their original story. Now, surprisingly, they've done genealogical research nowadays, uh, DNA testing on people who are Native American, and there's not a lot of Jewish ancestry uh, in there. But that's, that's another thing. Again, forgive me for being, I probably shouldn't say that too mockingly, but it's just this is what they believe, okay? Another fascinating thing is that, uh, here's a quote from, from the Book of Mormon, Joseph Smith wrote, wrote this. The whole face of the land, this is America way back in the day, had become covered with buildings, and the people were as numerous almost as if there were sand of the sea. So he's talking about these great civilizations, these big buildings, and guess what? Zero archaeological evidence has ever been found of these supposed civilizations in America. Uh, which is fascinating, because if you look at Scripture, if you look at the Bible, the Old Testament, you have all these stories of ancient civilizations, and we have tons, just innumerable uh, Mountains of evidence that show that these civilizations actually exist that archaeologists have found. Uh, and archaeologists will even, even if they don't believe in the Bible, they don't believe in God, they will still use the Bible and the Old Testament as reference points when they're trying to find certain places or civilizations because it's proven to be factual and, and reliable. Uh, wherefore, uh, if you look at the uh, Book of Mormon today, the Smithsonian Institute in America won't even count it as credible because they have not found anything uh, any archaeological evidence whatsoever of any of these ancient civilizations. Uh, which, again, is just something that should make you kind of go, hmm, right? So, I mean, there are these great cities, right? Why? And there's these huge battles when you find something. Uh, but no. Yeah, something. So, so here's the deal. So Joseph Smith, they translate this Book of Mormon. He starts selling it. He starts getting a group of followers who start to follow him. But everywhere that Joseph Smith goes... He gets run out of town. That's basically the story of the early Mormon church. He, uh, at first, um, uh, he, he gets run out of New York, so he, he ends up going to uh, Ohio, right? And he, in 1831, he, he gets kind of run out of New York. People aren't following there, so he has a vision. God tells him, you need to move, pick up everybody, and you've got to move to Kirkland, Ohio. So that's where they moved the Mormon church right away, 1831. 
Um, and the reason that they went there, surprisingly, is that there was already Mormon missionaries that sent out right away, and they were having success in Ohio. And there happened to be a Baptist minister there. His name was Sidney Rigdon, who had converted to Mormonism, and he brought his entire 100-member congregation with him. So Joseph Smith has this revelation. We need to go to Ohio. I just got 100 new converts there, right? And so he goes where the fruit is, and, he, and they go to Ohio, and they set up a Mormon church there. Uh, and they, and they kind of begin to build more, uh, Joseph Smith's uh, Mormon church empire there. Um, during that time, they send another group of missionaries. They end up going to Missouri, where Joseph Smith has this revelation that that is going to be the place of the New Jerusalem. The, the uh, Mormons believe that one day the New Jerusalem will literally be established here on earth, and it will literally be in Missouri. That's where it's going to be. And so they set up a temple there. They consecrated the site. This is exactly where Jesus is going to return, and this is where the new Jerusalem is going to be. Interestingly enough, it's the same place where the Garden of Eden was. Uh, it would, did you guys know that? It was in America, in Missouri. It was where Adam and Eve, or the Garden of Eden was, according to the Mormon church. That's literally what they believe. Um, and, and that is uh, why the new Jerusalem will also be there one day. So it's, as you can see, Mormonism is a very American-centric, um, very American-centric religion. All right, so they, they go there, but then, uh, of course, things get bad in Ohio. Joseph Smith runs out of Ohio. He ends up going to Missouri. Things get bad in Missouri. He gets run out of Missouri. He ends up going to Illinois, uh, where he, he goes to Illinois into, um, what's the name of it? I wrote it down. Nauvoo. Nauvoo, yeah, Nauvoo, Illinois. He goes to Nauvoo, Illinois. Uh, and then um, in 1835... <laughs> Joseph Smith publishes 135 of his revelations that, in, into another book of scripture called Doctrine and Covenants. So they have the Book of Mormon, they have Doctrine and Covenants. Another uh, scripture they have, we'll get into that maybe a little bit more, is uh, called Pearl of Great Price. So they actually have three books of scripture in addition to the Bible that they believe in. Um, but this is really, if you want to dig into like, some of the theology of what Mormons believe, Doctrine and Covenants is a lot of his revelations and what they believe. Well, um, because of moral persecution, um, I'm sorry, that, that, he, wrote, he wrote the Doctrine and Covenants when he was in Ohio, then he moved to Missouri, then he moved to Nevada, Illinois. So uh, more persecution happens, more persecution happens. Um, and then in 1843, so this is 13 years after the, the religion was started, he's in Illinois, and Joseph Smith re reveals uh, two new revelations that he's received from God. One is baptism for the dead uh, and, and plural marriage uh, is the second one. So the first is that you can baptize people for dead relatives so they can be saved into Mormonism. And then the second one is that you can marry multiple women. Uh, and it's good and it's commanded by God. And we'll get into that a little bit more too. But um, Joseph Smith practiced polygamy. It's something a lot of people in the LDS Church don't want to talk about too much because it's kind of a sensitive subject. He had, uh, they've actually admitted now, they don't know the number of wives he's had. He had so many. Uh, they think it may have been up to 40, but they don't know. Because once you hit 39, who's counting, right? I mean, now, some of, some of his uh, wives were as young uh, as, young as uh, there was one who was young as uh, 14 years old. Some were in their teens, 15, 16 years old. Some were much older. Some were already married to other people. Uh, and this is just historical facts if you get into who, who his wives were. Um, but he, he practiced polygamy. He believed that God ordained it. It's in the Doctrine of Covenants 132. I'm going to believe. I'll, I'll, I'll get into that a little bit later. Uh, and it is, his revelation, this is the way it should be. And then his uh, successor, Brigham Young, also practiced polygamy. He had 20 wives and 57 children. It's pretty incredible. That's a lot of kids. <laughs> so we don't know how many kids Joseph Smith had. He, with his original wife, I think it was like seven, but... Um, they don't know. They say maybe they don't know if he had any other ones, but with 40 wives, I think he probably had a few extra. Um, but they don't know. So anyways, so here's what happens after this, okay? 1844, Joseph Smith is in Illinois, and he decides he's going to run for president. Um, he decides he's going to run for president of the United States. Uh, there's a group of people that are not happy about this. And so they, uh, in, a, in, a, in a newspaper in the area, the Nauvoo Expositor, they start publishing things that are kind of against Joseph Smith. Uh, mainly taking issues with polygamy and some of the other things the Mormon church is doing. And so Joseph Smith gets mad. And he orders the newspaper to be destroyed. So they destroy the newspaper. Obviously, people get very upset when things like this happen. And they start to, the tension gets really high. So Joseph Smith, and again, the LDS church doesn't like talking about this. Uh, Joseph Smith calls out the church to form a militia to take to the streets to defend the church. 
right? So he's basically declaring war against the area that he's in, in a sense. And so the, uh, the, the whole state of Illinois basically charges Joseph Smith with treason. He's basically throwing a rebellion against the government, against the authorities there. They charge him with treason. Joseph Smith willingly uh, submits himself to be arrested. Uh, he, doesn't, he decides he doesn't want to fight the U.S. government or for whatever reason. And he gets arrested, him and his brother. They get thrown into prison. Okay? So Joseph Smith and his brother, they get thrown into prison in 1844. Here's a picture of the, the, the courthouse or the jailhouse where they were thrown into in Carthage, Illinois. Uh, and then in June 27, 1844, an angry mob of people who were just furious with Joseph Smith and all the things he was doing stormed into the jailhouse and shot his brother and Joseph Smith dead. Uh, four bullets to each of them, I believe. And supposedly the story goes Joseph Smith was trying to jump out of a window when they, when they, when they killed him. And so uh, this is going to sound kind of bad, but one of the best things to ever happen to the Mormon church, I think, was this moment because now Joseph Smith becomes a martyr. Joseph Smith's a martyr for the faith, for the persecution of the Mormon church. And in, a lot of times in religious groups, right, when your founder gets killed instead of everybody uh, running away, uh, a lot of times people, if, if they died for their faith in a sense, uh, it, it, people rally around this, right? And so Joseph Smith becomes an example. He becomes a martyr for the church. His successor, Brigham Young, then uh, through much, much persecution years later, eventually... He, uh, this is a reenactment of what happened, but eventually he gets a, a group of the Mormon church, and they end up leaving, and they head west to try to find freedom. And they go to Utah, uh, the Salt Lake area, where they end up find, founding what ends up becoming Utah and the Salt Lake City. That whole area uh, is founded by Brigham Young and the Mormons. And the reason they went there is because at that time it wasn't a state. It was outside of the U.S. I think it might have been part of Mexico at that time. I could be wrong. You can, you can check me on that. But he, they end up going there and forming their own civilization where the U.S. government doesn't have control over them and can't tell them what to do, and they can start their own religious, uh, they call it Zion or, or uh, Deseret, right? They, this is going to be their place where they're going to set up their holy, holy society, and that's what they do. And so if Brigham Young, that name sounds familiar to you, it's because of, uh, probably because of Brigham Young University, BYU. Have you ever heard of BYU before? That is a, a university run by the Mormon Church named after Brigham Young, the second prophet in Mormonism uh, after Joseph Smith. And so now Utah has become a, a hub for Mormonism. It's where most Mormons reside is in Utah, uh, but it's branched off now over the years into multiple different places, including Arizona, you know, all, all over the world now where there's about 16 million professing Mormons today. Uh, and the LDS church has grown tremendously over the last couple hundred years in, in size, in the number of converts, uh, in reach around the world. Uh, they, they have hundreds of billions of dollars in assets, uh, in land, in, uh, in just, uh, the, the, there's a thing that came out recently about how much money they had just set aside in stock markets and investments. Uh, is something almost a trillion dollars, something crazy, where if the Mormon church was its own country, it'd be one of the wealthiest countries in the world. Uh, so yeah, they, they have a lot of money, they have a lot of influence, their way disproportionate members of the Mormon church are now congressmen and senators and influence in the government. Uh, a very high disproportionate number of Mormons are CEOs of major companies in the United States. Uh, so the, the, the church, uh, the Mormon church has grown from this little band of, of people to now uh, being a very large, very powerful, very wealthy, wealthy force in the United States and around the world. And so that's kind of just the history, okay? Uh, I hope that, that kind of helps you kind of just understand kind of where the church came from. But what I really want to spend the rest of the time here today on is really going back to the original question, what is the difference between Mormonism and Christianity? You've probably heard some differences already, but I want to kind of dive into some of them. And so I just want to kind of work into some of their theology a little bit and just kind of compare and contrast, okay, what does Mormons say that they believe and what do Christians say that we believe? All right, and, and hopefully this will help us as maybe if you're having conversations with somebody who's LDS uh, at, or if you just want to understand a little bit more. So first off, here, here's, here's one. If, okay, what is the authority of the Mormon church? So the authoritative works of the, of the Mormon church are what they call the four standard works. Uh, their, their Bibles, they call it the Quad, which is kind of a cool name, because there's four books uh, in that. And each one of their books, kind of like the Bible, has multiple books within it as well. Um, they believe in the King James Version of the Bible, as long as it's translated correctly. Um, and so what they say... There's a quote from the Pearl of Great Price. That, so in their scripture, it says, The Bible is the word of God as far as it's translated correctly. And they believe that Joseph Smith actually started the translation of scripture. They have 
they have it. Um, so they believe that's an error. He didn't, he didn't finish it. Uh, but that section they believe is translated properly, and then they believe as long as they interpret it properly, then you can believe that the Bible is true, but only if you interpret it through the lens of what they believe. Uh, but we also believe the Book of Mormon to be the Word of God. So they hold the Bible, if it's translated correctly, and the Book of Mormon. Is the, you, know, and you can kind of see that right there. Um, that is their Word of God. So you have to look at one through the lens of the other, otherwise you're not going to see it properly. Uh, that's what they believe. And so they have these four books, Book of Mormon, Doctrine and Covenants, and Pearl of Great Price. And then as Christians, obviously, we believe in the Bible. Um, the Bible tells us all Scripture is breathed out by God. It's God-breathed. It's inspired by Him. So we believe that the Bible is the inspired narrative word of God, that it is true, and we don't need any other Scriptures. So that's what we believe. Um, Psalm 119, 160 says, The sum of your word is truth, and every one of your righteous rules endures forever. So it's not something that you know, that parts of it are true and parts of it aren't true. We believe that all the Bible is true and the authoritative word of God. So there, there's a bit of a difference there with authority. Here's another one. Um, they believe that revelation changes as received by the prophet. So Joseph Smith was the first prophet, and after every prophet goes on, they, uh, God appoints another prophet in their wake, in their succession, right, who then becomes the prophet of the church. So it was Joseph Smith and then Brigham Young and then so on and so forth until the current prophet still sits uh, in Utah today. And so they believe that revelation changes. So the Book of Mormon, if you actually look at the translations, you compare the 1830 edition to the current version, there's over 4,000 word changes over the years. Um, now, in Christianity, we believe in a, we have a closed canon of books, right? We have our scripture. It is closed. The, the books in the Bible are the books of the Bible. We're not adding any more. We're not taking any away. Uh, and the Bible does not change. Now, you might look at different translations we have out there today, and you go, oh, well, what about all these different translations? Okay, those are translations of the original text. The original text does not change. But as we get better manuscript evidence and other things, yeah, we might do a little bit differences in English as we, as we get better understanding of it. But... The original language, we don't, we don't touch it, we don't change it. Does that make sense? And I believe that our translations are incredibly good, incredibly accurate today. Um, but the Book of Mormon originally you know, translated from ancient Egyptian into English. Um, they believe that that is something that has, they've, they've made changes over the years uh, because apparently Joseph Smith didn't get it quite right or there's a few things that weren't correct in there and they changed a few things. And they believe that as long as the prophet receives revelation, that's okay because God spoke. If God speaks, we do what he says. Um, Here's another one. When, he, when it comes to God, when it comes to God, Mormons believe that God has a physical body. God has a physical body. Uh, if you look at Doctrine of the Covenants 130, 22, it says the Father has a body of flesh and bone as tangible as man's. So they believe that God is physically in a body. Uh, as Christianity, however, we look at God and we say, no, God doesn't have a body. God is spirit. Um, look at John 4, 24. God is what? Spirit. And those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Uh, now, again, Mormons claim that they believe in the Bible as long as it's properly understood. So they'll have some different ways that they try to explain that away to, to say, no, it's true. He actually does have a physical body. Uh, here's another thing about God that they believe. Um, Mormonism, when it comes to gods, it really is a polytheistic religion. Polytheism meaning many gods. Uh, Mormons believe in many gods. Look at, here's one of their teachings uh, of Joseph Smith. It says, I have always declared God to be a distinct personage Jesus Christ, a separate and distinct personage from God the Father and the Holy Ghost, a distinct personage or spirit. And these three constitute three distinct personages and three gods. So they believe in multiple gods. And if you dig deeper, they believe that these aren't the only gods. There are other gods out there as well. And these are just three of them that are kind of ruling here over earth. And so they really believe in a polytheism. They really believe there's a lot of different gods out there. And these are the three that are kind of over earth. And these are the three that we know about. Um, whereas Christianity is highly monotheistic, right? One God. We believe there is only one God. Look at Isaiah 43, 10 says, Before me no God was formed, nor shall there be any after me. Deuteronomy 32, 39 says, There is no God beside me. So again, you've got to reconcile that. And you see the huge difference. Many gods or Christianity is like, no, no other gods. There is no other God before me. There weren't going to be any after me. Mormonism also, by the way, teaches that eventually us as human beings can also become God one day. We'll talk about that in a little bit. So we can become a God too, which sounds fantastic. Uh, and so if you, you, can have, you can have your own planets as well. And so you see the difference, polytheism, monotheism, pretty stark contrast there. But again, Mormons will say, well, we're Christians. We're just the true restored Christians. You've seen it wrong. 
And we say, no, we hold so firmly to Scripture as it was originally written, and it says pretty clearly here that there are multiple gods. Again, these are, these are pretty stark differences. Here's another one. Mormons believe that God changes. God changes. He was once a man, actually. Uh, there's actually some, some teaching that they kind of distanced himself from. I think it was Brigham Young who actually believed that Adam was God and eventually became a God and became the God, uh, the Father. But um, that's kind of controversial. They don't like to talk about that. But they really do believe that God was a man once. I mean, here's something that, they, that uh, Joseph Smith wrote in, uh, in his Journal of Discourses. It says, God himself was once as we are now and is an exalted man. This is the teaching of Joseph Smith, right? So God was once a man, and then he changed. Through his righteousness and holiness, he eventually progressed into godhood. And, and uh, one day we can become like him as well. Uh, whereas Christianity, we go, hang on a second, God never changes. That's what we believe. And God was never a man. He's not a man, right? Uh, Malachi 3.6 says, I, the Lord, this is God speaking. He says, I, the Lord, what? Do not change. Pretty clear for us, right? He doesn't change. Hosea 11.9 says, I am God and not a man. So you look at this compared to uh, LDS teachings, and you go, how do they believe in Scripture and also see this, right? A lot of them are pretty vague on some of these issues. Maybe they didn't study it as closely, but a lot of them, they read their Bibles, and somehow they just explain these things away, or they don't see it clearly, or they're so indoctrinated with their own teachings that they have other ways of understanding this. And so they somehow are okay with these complete contradictions in what they say to believe in the Bible, but also their own teachings being totally different. All right. So aside from that, which, by the way, is there nothing scarier than a God that changes? Hey, you're saved. All right. Oh, changing my mind. You know? Oh, no. Right? Like, hey, this is how you earn your way to salvation. All right. You know, oh, I'm adding a few more rules. Actually, it's the other way. Actually, not you, but them. You know, I mean, can you imagine a God who changes his mind or who's fickle like human beings are? I mean, that's a scary thought. God changes, and so they're always trying to be attuned to, to who he is and what he's doing because he might, he might shift on you. And that's why they need a prophet to hear from God so that when the changes come down from heaven, we can be aware of them. All right, here's another one. When it comes to Jesus, where again, Mormons say, we follow Jesus, therefore we're Christians, right? Here's what Mormons believe when it comes to Jesus. They say that Jesus is one of three gods, we kind of read this passage earlier, right? Who share a singular purpose. So it's not one God and three persons like we believe in the Trinity. It's three different gods with one purpose. They're all working together. Um, Jesus in the, in the Bible is when they see the word Jehovah in the Old Testament, they say that's Jesus. When they see the word Elohim in the Old Testament, and if you remember, Bill preached a series about the names of God a while back, right? When you see the word Elohim in the Old Testament, that is God the Father. So they see Jesus and the Father, both two separate gods in the Old Testament, whenever they see Jehovah or Elohim. Um, uh, one of their prophets, Gordon B. Hinckley, who said this, the traditional Christ of whom they, meaning he's talking about Christians speak, is not the Christ of whom I speak. So again, he admits it, right? Jesus is different than what the Christians believe. We believe in a different Jesus. They don't believe in the same Jesus as us. Uh, Christianity, though, said what? Jesus is God, the second person of the Trinity. So we'll get into the Trinity here in a little bit, but one God and three persons. Okay, so there's only one God, but in three persons, which can be a little confusing, but we'll talk about that in some other class. Uh, but in the, uh, what Christians believe is the word Jehovah and Elohim in the Old Testament are interchangeable names for God. The word Jehovah literally means Lord. Anytime you see the word Lord uh, in the Old Testament, if it's in uh, capital L and then lowercase letters, that's the word Jehovah. If it's all caps, that's the word Yahweh. That's the name of God, right? Uh, and when you see the word Elohim in the Old Testament, that's usually translated God in our, in our Bibles. And so we see it as interchangeable names for God. And here's just one example, Deuteronomy 6.4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord, Jehovah, our God, Elohim, the Lord, Jehovah, is one. So the, the, the Old Testament is using the name interchangeably. Uh, there's other examples where they even say Jehovah Elohim, referring to one God. They put both of them, the Lord God, together, at referring to one person, and you see both those names interchangeably. So the, um, the LDS church will say, no, that's, that's just both of them, referring to both of them at the same time. Uh, a, a fascinating thing is even when Thomas saw Jesus after, you know, doubting Thomas, when Jesus resurrected, and he's like, I'm not going to believe until I, you know, can put my hands in the wounds. Um, even when, he, when Jesus showed to him, what, it, what the first thing that, that Thomas says to Jesus is, my Lord and my God. Um, he actually uses, you know, it probably wasn't in Hebrew, but he actually uses both those titles for Jesus in the New Testament. So uh, they believe in two separate gods there in the Old Testament. Uh, here's another thing they believe about Jesus we kind of touched on earlier is after the resurrection, Jesus came to America. 
So he, he maybe went to heaven, then came back down. I'm not sure how the path went. Uh, maybe he didn't go all the way up. Maybe he just kind of went over the ocean. Uh, he walked in water. He, he could have walked. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. That's, I didn't think about that one. <laughs> that's good. <laughs> But they believe that he came to America. Uh, here's one of their scriptures, the book of 3 Nephi. Uh, this is the book of Mormon, the 3 Nephi. It says, Behold, they saw a man descending out of heaven, and he clothed in white robes, and he came down, and he stood in the midst of them, and the eyes of the whole multitude were turned upon him. He stretched forth his hand and spake unto the people, saying, Behold, I am Jesus Christ, whom the prophets testify shall come into the world. And so that is him showing himself to the uh, Nephites in America. Supposedly. And uh, what, what do we believe as Christians? We believe, no, after the resurrection, Jesus ascended to heaven. That's what we believe. Uh, Acts 1, 10 through 11, it says, And while the disciples were gazing into heaven as they went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven okay, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. So we believe he went up to heaven. One day he's going to come back down. But until then, that's where Jesus is. Uh, that's what we believe as Christians. Again, pretty stark difference there. All right. Uh, when it comes to the Trinity, we kind of touched on this briefly uh, or earlier, so I'm going to just hit it really briefly. But Mormons believe three separate gods. God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Ghost. They believe those are three gods. They believe there are other gods as well. And they believe that you can also become a god one day if you do all the right things that they tell you to do. And then Christianity, what do we believe? The Trinity. God exists eternally in three persons. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Three persons, all one God, one God in three persons. It's very confusing. If you have questions about that later, we can talk to you because that will take a whole other class period to, <laughs> to, uh, to go over all that. But um, that's what we believe. We believe there is only one God. All right. When it comes to salvation, here's what, here's what they believe about salvation. You are saved by grace through works. It, it was the, it's the best way I would explain it. Uh, here's what their own scripture says in 2 Nephi 25, 23. For we labor diligently to write, to persuade our children, also our brethren, to believe in Christ. So you, by belief in Christ and to be reconciled to God. For we know that it is by grace that we are saved after all we can do. So we're saved by grace. If you say, if you say well, I believe we're saved by grace, Mormons would be like, me too. But they say we're saved by grace after everything we do. So by grace, through all the works that we do. And we say, as Christians, what do we say? No, you're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. That's what we believe as Christians, right? You're saved by grace through faith in Christ alone. For, like, look, just one example is Ephesians 2, 8, 9. says, for by grace you've been saved through faith. This is not your own what? Your own doing. It's not what we do. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. So we believe that we are just saved by grace. That's it. In faith in Jesus and by grace, right? Alone. And they believe it's no, you, can't, you can lose your salvation if you don't do all the right things and you won't be saved. Uh, and you have to earn God's grace, is what they believe. Uh, when it comes to eternity, this is where things get fascinating. Again, I've touched on this a little bit, but we can become gods according to the Mormon church. Um, it says uh, in um, one, of their, one of their prophets, Lorenzo Snow, said this. As man is, God once was. As God is, man may become. So God once was a man, then became a God, and therefore if that's possible for him, it's also possible for us. Good news. You can become a God as well. Uh, but in Christianity, what do we believe? We don't become gods. Not even close, right? Isaiah 43, 10 says, Before me no God was formed, nor shall there be any after me. I read that earlier, right? There aren't going to be any other gods after God. There aren't any before him. There aren't any after him. Deuteronomy 32, 39 says, There is no God beside me. So there's no other gods. And there's not going to be any other gods. That's not going to change. But the Mormon church says you can be, attain godhood as well. Um, now, this is interesting to me too, is they believe in heaven that there are three different levels of heaven. There are three different kingdoms of heaven. There is the celestial kingdom, which is the top kingdom. That's where you want to go if you do all the right things and you're a good Mormon and you uh, follow all the rules and do all the temporal practices, then you can earn your way into the celestial kingdom. Uh, then there's the terrestrial kingdom, which is kind of the middle road kingdom. Not bad, but not as good as the penthouse, right? And then there's the celestial kingdom, which is like the bottom level kingdom, which is okay. At least you're in. Uh, and then there's outer darkness, which is kind of like hell, and that's reserved for Mormon apostates, anybody who leaves the Mormon church after coming to faith in Mormonism. Uh, now, as Christians, we say, hang on. 
That's not what we believe. We believe that believers go to eternity in heaven. Believers in Jesus Christ will spend eternity with God in heaven. There's one heaven. That's where we're going, right? Unbelievers spend eternity in hell. That's just the way it goes for us as Christians. Uh, here's something really, really fascinating I found online. This is just kind of an example. I don't know if you can see this very well from where you're at. Uh, this is a, a chart of kind of what Mormons believe about eternity. And so if you look, let's see if I can go back over here. If you look, and this is something interesting, I don't have time to get too much into it. They believe that we are born uh, as spirit babies yeah. in heaven before we come down to earth. So God's populating the universe with his wives up in heaven, maybe one, maybe many, up in heaven. And he's populating spirit babies, and the spirit babies are waiting for humans to procreate so that they may come down to earth and be tested on earth in a physical body. Uh, so you start as a spirit baby, you come down to earth where you're tested. If you're a good Mormon, you follow the straight and narrow, you do all the good works, all the uh, chastity, tithing, you follow the words of wisdom, which is their dietary restrictions, you do all the temple rites, uh, their endowment ceremonies, you get sealed in heaven, all these other different things that they practice, then you can go to the celestial kingdom. Isn't that fantastic? Uh, but it's kind of like shoots and ladders. Have you ever played that game? <laughs> Where you make a bad step as a Mormon, you fall into apostasy. All of a sudden, <laughs> outer darkness. That's rough. Okay? You don't want to hit that space. Okay? That's just the way I think about it. <laughs> um, now, this next one, there's the Broadway, which will bring you to the Telestial Kingdom. That's if you're good and honorable, but you're blinded by the craftiness of men. That would be Christians today. We, good news... If you're a Christian, you die today, you still, according to Mormons, get to go to the second kingdom. That's not bad, right? We're not the worst people. All right. You know, we may have been deceived by the craftiness of men, but I'll take it. Um, better than being a failed Mormon, right? Uh, and then there's the low way. That's for the dishonest, the liars, sorcerers, adulterers, and whoremongers. Uh, so people like Hitler still get to the bottom level of heaven. They get to the lowest kingdom. All right? But if you are, leave the Mormon church, you fall into that regardless. Now, I don't know about you, and this is me, I'm trying to be objective here, but this is where you can see a little bit of the control of Mormonism. The scariest thing for somebody who's a Mormon is to not be a Mormon anymore. Because for you, it's reserved out regardless. For you, you're just owned by your family. You, you lose all the, 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 the everything you've ever known. You, you, a lot of people lose business practices because a lot of their clients will come there because they're part of their church. They'll lose family members because they'll be disowned from the family. You can't go to the temple. We'll talk about that in a little bit anymore because you're not a good Mormon. And you can't go to any of the marriage ceremonies, any of the baptisms, anything that happens in the temple. Uh, and you are, are kicked out of your faith, and you're reserved for outer darkness. And that is a terrifying place to be. Um, so... That's what, that's just, hopefully that helps you get a little bit of an understanding of what they believe about eternity and salvation in that way. All right. Um, moving on a little bit here. All right. And then, I, I wish I had more time to get into it because women have a harder time getting into the celestial kingdom as well. You need, you need your husband to help you. Um, yeah. This is so interesting. We're so involved with them. Can we do another section of this? Maybe. We're running out of time. I'm going long. All right. Because, I mean, we that we know our neighbors are, and I want to yeah. know more about it. Yeah, that might be something we can set up another time, but we can talk about that. Okay, so, all right, yeah, i got to fly through the rest of this because I talk long. Um, the church, okay, here's what they believe about the church. The Mormon church is the restored church. They're the only true church. That's what they believe. We talked about that a little bit. Um, Joseph Smith wrote, I was, I was answered when he prayed, I must join none of them, the Christian churches, for they were all wrong, and the person is Jesus who addressed me said that all their creeds were an abomination in the sight of in his sight, that those professors were all corrupt. So the entire church is corrupt, according to Joseph Smith. He is the only one who has the true knowledge that everyone needs to get from him. Uh, Christianity obviously believes that the church consists of the body of all true believers. For it's in one body of all many members, so on and so forth. Uh, we believe in, that anybody who believes in Jesus, truly believes in Jesus, is part of the church. We call the church invisible, right? The church that you know, we, we can't see it necessarily, but God knows who all of us are. And we are all part of the true church as one body, one family. Uh, one of the big things about Mormonism is the temple. The temple is a big deal in Mormonism. Everything runs through the temple. They believe the temple ordinances, these things they have, endowment ceremonies, baptisms, baptisms for the dead, the sealing ceremonies where they, they marry and they're sealed for all eternity to their spouse. Uh, that all happens in the temple. That is part of their means of salvation. That is part of their good works in order to achieve the celestial kingdom. Uh, if you look at what uh, they wrote here, uh, 
This guy, uh, Russell M. Nelson, who's one of their prophets, said, Temple ordinances, covenants, endowments, and ceilings enable individuals to be reconciled with the Lord and families to be sealed beyond the veil of death. So for Mormons, for Mormons family is eternity. You're going to live, you're going to spend eternity with your family. So family is everything to them. They're very family-oriented, which is a very positive attribute. Part of the reason that is, though, is because they believe that they're going to spend all eternity together. And you want to you have a good family if you're going to spend eternity with them. For some of us, that sounds like hell, right? <laughs> um, oh, that was a bad joke. That was a bad joke. But, <laughs> but look what they say. Obedience to temple covenants qualifies us for eternal life, the greatest gift of God to man. So you have to follow all the temple ceremonies and rites. You can't go into the temple unless you receive a temple recommend, which requires a bunch of mandatory things, including tithing. If you don't tithe, you can't go to the temple. Um, and, and you fall out of good favor with them. A lot of different things like that. Whereas Christians, we say the temple is no longer needed. Right? Jesus said in Matthew 12, 6, that te- something greater than the temple is here. Uh, in in uh, 2 Corinthians 6, 16, and Ephesians 2, 20, even, uh, we see that believers are the temple of God. Right? Our body is the temple, and Christ is the cornerstone of the temple in us. So the temple is no longer necessary. All the sacrifices in the Old Testament that they used to practice to atone for their sins no longer needed. Jesus paid for all that. He fulfilled all that. It is all fulfilled in him. So we no longer need a temple. But according to Mormonism, yes, we do need the temple. That's why they build them all over the place. Uh, they also believe in a priesthood. Uh, there, there's the Aaronic priesthood and the Melchizedek priesthood. And the Aaronic priesthood, um, it's a lesser priesthood. So any men who are 12 years up, they're able to... Uh, to be Aaronic priests in the Mormon church, which just means they're of good standing in the church, uh, and, and they can do certain different things and hold different leadership positions. But they're doing that in preparation to achieve what they call the Melchizedek priesthood, which is the greatest priesthood that you can have after about 18, I believe, uh, where you go and you can now do performance of different things in the temple, and uh, you can be sealed for eternity, you can go on your, your mission trip and all these other things, and then you are a leader in the church. Uh, and this is for men only in the priesthood. Okay. Uh, in Christianity, obviously, we, we don't have a priesthood anymore. Uh, we believe that Jesus is our high priest. That's what Hebrews 6, 20 says. Jesus has gone on the four on our behalf, having become a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek, who's an Old Testament priest. We're not time to get into that. But Jesus is our high priest, right? And, and we also believe in the priesthood of all believers. Uh, 1 Peter 2, 9 says, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. So we believe that all believers are part of the priesthood of God, and Jesus is our high priest. So, big difference there where Mormons only believe that men can hold it and only if you follow the certain things that they say you have to do. All right. How much time I got? Okay, I'm get through this. <laughs> uh, marriage. When it comes to marriage, this is a big thing for Mormons. Marriage is eternal. We talked about that a little bit. Um, so they say, temple ordinances, covenants, endowments, ceilings enable individuals to be reconciled with the Lord and families to be sealed beyond the veil of death. So you, when you go to the temple ceremony, you are sealed in one of the sealing rooms. You are sealed for all eternity with your spouse. And obedience to temple covenant, uh, covenant qualifies us for eternal life. Uh, Christianity says there will be no marriage in heaven. And that's a little bit hard for us to swallow sometimes because we love our spouses. But Jesus himself said this in Matthew 22, 30. For in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like the angels in heaven who are married. Okay? Uh, Mark 12, 25 says, For when they rise from the dead, they neither marry or are given in marriage, but are like the angels in heaven. So the Bible tells us there isn't marriage in heaven. Mormonism says it's eternity in heaven. In fact, you're going to have multiple wives possibly. Isn't that great? And so very different contrast to what Jesus said to what Mormonism says as well. Um, here's a, uh, just a picture real quick of uh, inside the Mormon temple. This is the ceiling roofs. The one on the right is actually the one in Gilbert that we went and saw when I got to tour it. The one on the left is somewhere else. Uh, but they're actually, this is where they go, and they kind of go to this altar, kneel before each other, looking into each other's eyes. On each side, there's mirrors where they're kind of seeing the mirrors, and other, uh, the mirrors are reflecting off one another, so it looks like it goes on forever. That's to symbol, symbolize eternity. And so they, you are sealed to your spouse for all time. Uh, so to get divorced in Mormonism is a big deal. You have to unseal yourself from your divorced spouse Otherwise, you're stuck with them for all eternity. So you got to get that done as well. Um, also, there's a lot of... The, now, today, they, they'll say, well, we don't practice polygamy today. We don't endorse it today. But if you're sealed to one woman or one man, uh, and, that, and then that person passes away and you want to remarry, it, con- it causes a bit of a conundrum, right? So if you're sealed to somebody, they pass away. So, so if a man's sealed to a woman and she passes away, he can marry another woman. He can be sealed to her as well, and he'll have both of them in heaven, Right? Uh, if a woman is, can only be sealed to one man, though. So if a woman's husband passes away, then she's got to unseal herself from him through a whole ceremony and then be resealed to the other person. So that person doesn't get her in eternity anymore. 
Uh, and so it gets a little bit, a little bit, uh, a little bit hairy there. Um, it's it's noon, so if, if you all need to go, I think we can go a little bit longer if everybody wants to. But if you all need to leave, you can. I, I understand. I want to be honored of your time, but I, I want to get through a little bit more of this if that's okay. Is that okay with you guys? Okay. So uh, marriage, uh, polygamy in Mormonism was encouraged, now repealed. Okay. Um, Joseph Smith, as I said earlier, he had somewhere around 40 wives. We don't know exactly. The Doctrine of the Covenant is 132. This is where you can, you can read it today. You can pull it up on Google if you want. Read the whole thing I did. Um, is all about this revelation that Joseph Smith gets. And he says, Behold, I reveal unto you a new and everlasting covenant. This is going to be forever. Um, and if ye abide not that covenant, then ye are damned. For no one can reject this covenant and be permitted to enter into my glory. So... Paul, polygamy is baked in, and he goes in and describes it. Now, apparently his, wife, his first wife, Emma, was not a fan of polygamy. Um, and actually, if you read, I know, surprising, if you read Doctrine of the Covenants 132, it actually includes a quote in there. Uh, it says this. I didn't have it up on the screen, but it says, I commanded my handmaiden, Emma Smith, this is Joseph writing this mm -hmm. command, to abide and cleave unto my servant Joseph and to, no, and to none else. But if she will not abide at this commandment, she shall be destroyed saith the Lord, for I am the Lord thy God and will destroy her if she abide not in my law. So within Mormon scripture is a threat to Joseph Smith's own wife if she doesn't get on board with polygamy that she's going to be destroyed by God. Uh, so take that for what it is, this everlasting covenant of polygamy. Now they will say, miraculously, aha, Utah wasn't going to be allowed to become a state. Why? The United States, if you know your U.S. history, didn't like that polygamy was going on there. So they said, you're not going to be allowed to become a state and have senators and be part of the, part of the U.S. government if you don't get rid of polygamy. So what, it, what happened? Well, the prophet had a revelation. And in 1896, they decided they weren't going to be, more, they weren't going to be polygamous anymore, and they were able to become part of the United States. Okay? And, and now here's something interesting that you'll find is that there are different sects, uh, different denomination branch offs of Mormonism today that still do practice polygamy. Uh, some in northern Arizona still go on today, uh, and some in other areas. Actually, if you go to Salt Lake City today, you will still find members of the LDS church who are in polygamous multiple marriages. Uh, it's just kind of hush-hush. We don't talk about that. Um, you'll find a lot of people who came from families that were polygamous. Uh, and it, it is still something that still exists, but it's kind of, we don't condone that anymore. But it still happens, and again, even if you don't believe in it, in it present life, you still believe that you may be sealed to multiple people in heaven. Uh, and polygamy may still happen there. Uh, now, again, Christianity does not encourage polygamy whatsoever. Now, polygamy is in the Bible. If you read your Bible, you'll see different kings who have multiple wives. But you'll, if you read carefully, you'll see that it never says this is a great and wonderful thing. That Solomon had nine, was it 900 wives or something ridiculous. 300 wives, 900 concubines. It was something crazy, right? Um, it never says that was a good thing for me. Actually, that was the downfall of most people in Scripture is having too many wives. Uh, it's, it's one of these that led a lot of people away from faith in God. Uh, and so, monogamy is never, uh, or polygamy is never encouraged in Scripture. In fact, monogamy is. So if you look at the qualifications for elders in 1 Timothy 3.2, it says an overseer, an elder, must be above reproach, the husband of well, how many wives? One. All right? So you should only have one wife. Joseph Smith, no, I think I need more. Um, but, again, very big differences there. Okay, here's a quick one for a baptism. Uh, baptism, this is a big one for Mormons. They, they believe in baptism of the dead. And because of that, genealogy is a huge deal for Mormons. They, they have, uh, actually, my, my wife actually got an app that one of her friends told her about who's in the Mormon church that, that they do. is kind of like, uh, what's, what's the, uh, the genealogy one that most people do? It's ancestry. It's kind of like that, except it's like the LDS version. And they do a ton of really, actually really quality genealogical work. That you can go in there and you can actually put your stuff in. Maybe the church will contact you. I don't know. So maybe you shouldn't do that. But <laughs> we did. <laughs> I hope they knock on my door. But I, uh, we, we can go there and you can put in your information. And you can look at all your genealogical history. And, and they do a lot of different work on it. Why? Because they believe that their ancestors are not going to be able to go to the celestial kingdom unless they get baptized on their behalf. So then that way Jesus can go speak to them where they're at. And they can hear the true gospel and have an opportunity to convert. So they practice baptism for the dead. And there's a bunch of different scriptures over there. I can't uh, have time to get into it. But uh, the Bible is very clear to avoid things like divination, fortune tellers, mediums, necromancers, people bringing the living to the dead back to life. Right? One who inquires of the dead, they're an abomination is what the Bible says in Deuteronomy 18. Uh, and Jesus said to them, follow me and leave the dead to bury their own dead. So he wasn't concerned about people who are already dead. He's concerned about the living, right? 1 Timothy 1, 3 through 4 says, Do not devote yourself to endless genealogies. Um, but 
For Mormons, doing genealogical work is part of their way of earning salvation by baptizing themselves for the dead, for their, their, uh, and their, their children for the dead. Um, on behalf of their dead relatives, and they need to do all the work because they want to make sure that they all have an opportunity to become Mormons in the afterlife. Uh, and here's just another in, in the temple in Gilbert when I went and saw it. Here's what it looks like. There's 12 oxen underneath that represent the, supposedly the 12 tribes of Israel. Uh, and a fascinating thing about it is it's always on the bottom floor because it represents the beginning path of salvation working your way up towards heaven. So... Um, it's, it's really ornate, it's really beautiful, it's really incredible, and a little bit cultish looking because of all the oxen, I don't know. And something about like the whole story about Moses and the golden ox makes me go like, Ugh. Um, But that's, that's the way it looks. So but again, very different from what we do. It, it doesn't look like our ACC baptistry, does it? Uh, maybe I can talk to Pastor Bill about that. Well, maybe, <laughs> I don't know. So, anyways. That's what that looks like. Okay, um, here's one last thing that I really want to make sure we hit really, really fast. Um, and this is a really controversial thing in Mormonism, is race. Okay, racism in early Mormonism, in the Book of Mormon, is encouraged, and then later it was repealed. So, um, I, I kind of mentioned this earlier. Here's one quote from Alma 3.6. It says, The skin of the Lamanites were dark, according to the mark which was set upon their fathers, which was a curse upon them because of their transgressions and their rebellion. So, they had dark skin, therefore that's because God cursed them. So they believe that people with dark skin, Native Americans, and particularly African Americans, uh, were cursed. They believe in the curse of Cain. It's in their scripture that Cain and Abel, you know, when Cain murdered Abel, that God actually turned his skin black because he murdered his brother. And that's where African American people are descended of. So they're cursed by God. Uh, that is in, in Mormon scripture. You can look it up. It's still there. Um, but, again, miraculously, in 1978, after the Civil Rights Movement, the prophet Spencer Kimball had a new revelation that now people with dark skin are allowed to be in the Mormon church. They're allowed to, before they're kind of held to the outskirts, they weren't allowed to be priests. Now people with dark skin can be priests. Now they can eventually, now they can go to the celestial kingdom. You can't go to the celestial kingdom unless you're a priest. Um, so now they're allowed. Uh, thank you. Thankfully, their God changes, right? Um, but there's still some things that affect that. They believe that like spirit babies, I'm probably getting in the weeds here, but they believe that spirit babies um, the good ones get to go to good families, and the bad ones got to go to the better, the worst families, right? So, and this kind of leads into it. So, the, the good Mormon families, one of the reasons they have so many wives and need to have so many kids is so that all the good spirit babies will have places to go. Um, and, and they get to go to good Mormon families, but the bad ones, they get to go to families that are broken, families that are darker skin color, uh, families that are not Mormon. That's what they originally believed. And so, again, that all, that all plays into this, this kind of class system that they have. Uh, where, again, Christianity, all people are created equal. We're all created in the image of God. There is no distinction between any skin color. It doesn't matter what color your skin is. God cares about your heart. Right? It's not the outward appearance. Uh, no one is, is, because of their skin color, can't get into heaven. And, and that's never, ever even been a thought in Christianity. Uh, now, there are some things about slavery in the Bible. It's a little bit different. We need to talk about that another time. But um, it never, the Bible never condones and encourages slavery. It just talks about a reality that exists in that time. And what do we do with that, right? All right. Um, here's more stuff I don't even have time to get into, okay? There's, they have temple garb that they wear after they go through these endowment ceremonies. In the temple, once you've achieved a higher order where you actually wear, as some people refer to it as holy underwear, it's like white clothes that they wear underneath all their garments. They're not really allowed to show it to anybody, but they have to wear them if you're in that standing. They don't get them until after, the, again, they're 18 and they kind of achieve that level of, in it. Uh, but it's like a pure, purity thing. And there's some different symbols on there. quite fascinating. Um, temple recommends is like they... If you are a good Mormon, you get a temple recommend. It's like a, it's like a club card that you can go into the temple, right? And if you don't have that, you're not allowed to get into the temple. And if you do something bad, they take it away from you, right? So there's kind of this, this uh, merit and an achievement and reward system for being able to get your club-carrying Mormon card so that you can go into the temple so you can be part of all the sealing ceremonies for, for marriages, for baptisms. Otherwise, you've got to wait on the outside of the temple for your family to come out. Right, um, and everybody knows that you're not as good of a Mormon as the other Mormons who went inside. And it can be pretty shameful to not have that. Um, they believe that Christ's blood doesn't cover all sins. Um, some sins that aren't covered by it, some are, uh, and it's a whole other thing. Uh, tithing is a means of salvation. It's not just something you're encouraged to do. You have to give 10% to be in good standing in the Mormon church. They check up on that, and you have to do it. Um, one of the reasons the Mormon church is so incredibly wealthy. If all the Christians would actually tithe, <laughs> the Christian church would be too. But, um, no, it, but they really do. It, it, it is, they have to. If you don't, you could not get to the highest level of heaven. 
Uh, the words of wisdom is something they have. It's their dietary restrictions. If you ever talk to some Mormons, some of them, they don't drink caffeine or coffee uh, or, or they don't smoke or do other things. It's because of this whole dietary restriction that they follow. And there's a whole lot of other things that, and just flat out, if you compare it to Christianity, it's just not in the Bible. It's just not in the Bible. So here's their really conclusion. I, I know I went over. I'm sorry for that. But the, what's the real difference in, in this is the difference between Christianity and Mormonism is massive. We use similar terminology, but if you get into the definitions, if you ever have a conversation with somebody who's Mormon, start trying to define what they mean when they say words like Holy Spirit, Jesus even, salvation. What do you mean by that? How do you achieve that, right? Um, and then you'll see huge, huge stark contrasts in that. Um, right before I go, um, if you all want a copy of these slides or anything, just shoot me an email. Or, or, um, uh, and, uh, it's just my name. It's B for Brandon, Hilgeman, none of you will be able to spell, <laughs> at azcc.org. Um, it, is it on the church website? Or just email the church and just let them know about it. And if you don't have my email address, I'll send you a copy of these slides and you can get all the pictures and stuff. If you want some recommended resources, these are some books that I found helpful. Kingdom of the Cults by Walter Martin. Ten Most Important Things You Can Say to a Mormon by Ron Rose. This is a book I had to read in Sunday. It's really good. <laughs> Uh, and then if you want something that's a little bit more uh, story-driven, there's a book, Unveiling Grace, that I read by Lynn Wilder. Um, I don't know too much about her or her theology, but I do know that it's the story of a, she was a BYU professor who converted to Mormonism when she was younger and then uh, ended up coming out of Mormonism after 30 years uh, in, in Utah at BYU. Um, and her story with that and all of her family and everything else is pretty fascinating. Um, gives you a lot of insights into their life, and it's written more of like a memoir style, so it's more of a story. It's, it's interesting. The other two are more academic. So those, those I found helpful if you, if you want to check those out. So that's all I got. All right. Um, thank you. Thank you.